Let us turn to the Word of God. The first letter of Timothy, chapter 2. There's one great advantage or disadvantage, depending whether you're in the pew or the pulpit, of working through a book. It means you've got to take all the awkward texts and all the difficult passages. You've just got to work steadily on. And we've got one or two verses in this chapter that... Um, well, I expect you'll be waiting to hear what I've got to say about them. First letter of Timothy, chapter 2. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all men, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life, godly and respectful in every way. This is good and it is acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony to which was born at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and apostle, I am telling the truth, I am not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in truth, in faith and truth. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Also that women should adorn themselves modestly and sensibly in seemly apparel, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly attire, but by good deeds, as befits women who profess religion. Let a woman learn in silence with all submissiveness. I permit no woman to teach or to have authority over men. She is to keep silent. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet woman will be saved through bearing children if she continues in faith and love and holiness with modesty. Well, there's quite a lot in that passage to occupy our attention this morning. Well, any preacher who tackles this chapter must pray the prayer strong and brave to face the foe before he does so. But before we get through to the more controversial part of the chapter, let's start right at the beginning. There are many things that this Bible is quite inadequate to tell you. There are no instructions in this book as to how to bake a cake. There are no instructions in this book as to how to drive a car. There are no instructions in this book as to how to build a computer. You'll have to get all that kind of knowledge from somewhere else. It doesn't even tell you how to get to the moon, but I'll tell you what it does tell you. It tells you how to get to heaven. And there is no scientist on earth yet discovered any other way, nor ever will. And there is enough in this book to tell us all we need to know about living the Christian life. You don't need any other book than this to learn how to be a Christian and how to continue to walk with Christ. It tells you how to be a Christian in your home, in the intimacies of married life and as parents. It tells you how to be a Christian at work with your boss, with that awkward person you work for, or with those awkward people who work for you. Above all, this book tells you how to be a Christian in church which is sometimes the most difficult place to be a Christian, even when you're surrounded by the Lord's people. It's all right, provided you don't get too close to each other and just nod and say politely good morning as you come in and out of church. But if you really start loving one another and getting close in fellowship, you will discover that all have feet of clay, that all of us have awkward corners that need to be knocked off. And living together in fellowship is what Christ has called us to. Now these books, Timothy, 2 Timothy and Titus, are concerned with living together in church as Christians. 
so that people can say, see how these Christians love each other. And first of all, Paul deals with our worship, the services we hold. And he deals with two things. First, our duty, what we ought to do by way of prayer and preaching. And then secondly, our demeanor, which is as important as our duty. We have a duty to pray, we have a duty to preach. But there is also a demeanor. It concerns such things as men's hands and women's dresses. And the Bible has quite a lot to say about this. Indeed, it's quite a study to study what the Bible says about fashion. But we're going to look at the men and the women and their demeanor in worship. Well, now, first of all, our duty. And the two key words in the first part of this chapter are all and one. And if you've got a Bible that you don't mind scribbling on, and I hope you have, just put a little ring round the words all and the words one in the first six verses of this chapter. We are going to look at the inclusive nature of Christianity and the exclusive nature. Our prayer must be inclusive of all men, but our preaching must be exclusive and about one man, the man, Christ Jesus, about the one God and the one mediator. So that this is the contrast. When we pray, we must be as wide as the human race. We must pray for all men. But when we preach, we must preach about one man and only one the man Christ Jesus. This is our double duty, to be as wide and as narrow as that. Wide in our prayer, narrow in our preaching. Well, first of all, then, let's look at our prayer. We are exhorted to live on a big map, not to forget a single member of the human race, millions though there are, and to pray for them. We can't pray for them by name, but we can at least pray for all men, and include the world in our prayers and not just pray for me, my aunt and my children. We can enlarge our prayers to pray for a whole human race that is in desperate need. Paul uses some interesting words for prayer in verse 1. Supplication, prayer, intercession. He's not just piling up the words, everyone is significant. A supplication is a word that is only used of beggars. It is a beggar who supplicates. It's a beggar who says, I've got nothing to eat. Will you give me something? It's a beggar who says, I've got nothing to wear. Can you spare an old coat? Only beggars supplicate. And therefore, prayer is a thing for beggars and for no one else. The kind of prayer that God loves to hear is the prayer of a beggar. And we come this morning as beggars. It was George Bernard Shaw who said forgiveness is a beggar's refuge. I don't care. I'm a beggar, you're a beggar. Because it's the one thing we can't find for ourselves, forgiveness. You don't come to church to patronize the church or God. You come as a beggar. We may have nice clothes, we may have had a good breakfast. But for spiritual food, we're beggars. And unless God gives us something to eat this morning, we'll go away hungry. As far as our spiritual clothes go, we're in rags. Naked, come to thee for dress. We're beggars. And the first note in prayer ought to be the note of supplication. We're begging God for something because we'll find it nowhere else. Make your supplications. That's a sense of need. The second word, prayer, is something that is never offered to men. You ask people for things, but to ask God for something is different. And when you say, God, could I please have this? You are praying. You don't offer prayers to human beings. And the word prayer means when you come, remember that you come as a beggar and remember that you're coming to God, not just a human being. You're coming to God. Beggars a beggar would beg from God. And the third prayer, the third word he uses here, intercessions. 
is used exclusively of a petition presented to a king. A king. In other words, if you had the opportunity to, to go to Queen Elizabeth and ask her for something, you would go with this word intercession in your mind. To intercede was a word kept exclusively in the ancient world for going to a throne. So when you come to pray, remember this, you're a beggar coming to a throne. Now that's a conception of prayer that will get us in the right mood, that will teach us the right words, that will give us the right attitude and spirit. I'm a beggar standing before a king. And yet he says, what do you want? What can I give you? What can I do for you? And this is how we come this morning. Beggars to a throne. Then I want you to notice the fourth word he uses for prayers. Thanksgivings. Let the cycle of prayer go the whole circle. You've supplicated, you've begged, and God will give. Let it return in blessing to God in thanksgiving. The only thing that you and I can ever give to God is thanks. We've nothing else to give. Everything that I have he gave to me first, but my thanks to him is something that he didn't give me first. I can give that to him from me alone. So here is the cycle of prayer. A beggar before a king saying, give me. And a beggar coming back and saying, thank you. Well, like every minister, I get beggars coming to the door. You probably get them too. People coming up to you at the station or at the bus station and begging. I can only recall one, I think, whoever came back and said, thank you. Only one. And Jesus healed ten lepers and one of them said, I must go back and say thank you. Now this is the cycle of prayer. Please, thank you. Please that things may flow down from the throne to the beggar. Thank you flowing up from the beggar to the throne. And that's how we pray. And that's what Paul is asking us to do when we come to church. Come as a beggar to say thank you for last week and please for next week, but not just for yourself, for everybody in the whole wide world. We are to pray for all men and their masters. We're to pray for kings, for emperors, whether they be Christian or not. You see, by the time Paul wrote this, it is probable that the emperor was a man called Nero. And it is probable that it was under Nero that Paul was to have his head chopped up off. But Paul says, pray for this man. Pray for him. When the early Christians were told to bow down and worship the emperor, they used to say this, and I'm quoting a man from Antioch. He said, I will not worship the emperor, but I promise to pray for him. I promise to pray. I will not worship him, but I will promise to pray. Today is United Nations Sunday, the 25th anniversary of United Nations organization. We do not worship that organization. We do not think it can bring lasting peace. Only Christ can do that. We do not think United Nations can solve the problems of the world. We do not worship it, but we pray. Because those set in authority today who are responsible for peace are not the kings and queens. There are very few of them left anyway, and those that are have little power. It is the presidents, it is the foreign secretaries, it is the United Nations delegates. It is in their hands that peace lies. And even though we know that until the Prince of Peace comes, the world can't have peace, we pray, and we pray for those set in authority. We pray for them. And someone, one of our members who is working now in the United Nations will be leading us in prayer later in the service for peace. Why? For the very simple reason that the gospel can be furthered in peace. That men can live godly and quiet lives in peace. War shatters, war disturbs, war cuts countries off from the gospel. 
in most churches I've been into that have been up any length of time, there is a tablet with names on it of casualties. Those who went away to wars and didn't come back. First World War, Second World War. I have long wanted to have another memorial tablet in churches. Those who went to the war and came back, but came back spiritually dead. The thousands of men in Britain who went to church until they went to war and came back and they had seen such godless and such terrible things they couldn't get back into church. One man told me honestly, he said, I don't feel I can face God after what I had to do in the war. And it's the spiritual casualties of war, not just the physical, that we bemoan. We're told to pray for those who can bring a measure of peace that the frontiers may be open, that hot and cold wars may be neutralized so that the gospel may spread and all men may come to the truth. You certainly can't send missionaries through a war. It disrupts the spread of the gospel. It sets up barbed wire barriers between men and men. And so we're to pray for this, that we may live godly and quiet lives, or as the New English Bible puts it, that we may live in full observance of religion and high standards of morality. Of course, some people could say to me, well, peace doesn't bring that. I know it doesn't. In peace, you've got the leisure and the luxury to live low standards of morality. Therefore, it is not enough just to pray for the peace of the world. It is important to go on to preach the truth in that peace. The reason why we should pray for all men is that God, in his goodness, desires all men to be saved. Let it never, never be said in the name of Christ that God only wants a few people to be saved. The Bible does not say that. Robbie Burns caricatured that ultra-Calvinism which said this when he wrote the poem, O God, who pleasest best thyself, sends ain to heaven and ten to hell, all for thy glory, and no for any good or ill they've done it for thee. What a blasphemous poem. My Bible tells me this. It is not the pleasure of the Lord that the wicked should die. God desires all men to be saved. The translation I read is a good deal more accurate than the authorized version, which has who wills all men to be saved. And when people have read that, they've said, well, if God wills it, it must happen, and therefore everybody's going to be saved anyway, and we don't need to be worried about the people who are going to be lost. That is a travesty of Scripture. The word here is not the strong word wills in the sense of decrees, but desires once. Let us tell everybody in Guildford, God wants you to be saved. Let's tell anybody who listen, God wants you in heaven. It is our solemn duty to do so. I know that it is a lovely truth taught in Scripture, and I believe it, that God chose us in Christ from before the foundation of the world. But God never intended that truth to prevent us from saying that he desires all men to come to the knowledge of God. Which brings me from prayer to preaching. If our prayer is to be as wide as that and inclusive of the whole human race, our preaching must be as narrow as this. There is one God and there is one mediator between man and God, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. That's a summary of my creed. I believe that. I preach it. First of all, there is one God. A man who says there is no God is lying. It's not the truth. There is one God. A man who says there are two gods, one goody and one baddie, as many people believe, is lying. It's not the truth. A man who says there are many gods that you've got to keep happy is not telling the truth. And people who are kept in the darkness of believing that there is no God or many gods need to come to a knowledge of the truth. There is one and only one let us realize again that this puts the lid on any idea that all religions are much the same and that it doesn't matter which one you adopt. There is only one God. It is not Allah, it is Jehovah. That's his name. There's only one God. 
and there is only one mediator between men and God. Let me tell you two stories to make this real. A few years ago, I lived in Arabia, as you know, and there I was in the middle of Islam. That's the most difficult mission field in the world. Out of six million Arabs, there were less than two dozen Christians. The rest had all been killed off for their faith by those who worshipped Allah. And during Ramadan, we saw the Muslims gather in their crowds and they were shrieking in their Arab language, there is no God but God and Muhammad is his prophet. Or there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. But I need more than a prophet, I need a mediator. Even if Muhammad were a prophet, a prophet is someone who can speak to men on behalf of God but I want someone who can speak to God on behalf of me. I need a go-between. That's what a mediator means. Somebody will speak both ways. Somebody will have God's hand in one hand and mine in the other and can bring his arms together. That's what a mediator is. And therefore I noticed when I spoke to Muslims, when I had contact with them, this. They believe they've got a word from God, but they've got no one to speak to God for them. Therefore, they have no assurance of forgiveness. Their own teachings in the Quran can bring them to a knowledge of sin, but it cannot bring them to a knowledge of salvation. That's why they need the gospel. And so they said, there is no God but God, and Muhammad is his prophet. My creed, there is no God but Jehovah, and Jesus is my mediator. Or well, let's come a little nearer home. I stood on those pulpit steps last night talking to a young girl who was talking to me about church unity and she said there's no real difference between us two. We pray to the same God. You pray through Jesus. I pray through Mary and there's no real difference. And to her, there is one God and one mediator, Mary. But Mary can't be a mediator for me. I said, why do you pray to Mary? She said, well, if I want anything out of my dad, I, I always get my mum to get round him. And it sounds quite logical. I do the same. So I had to say that our heavenly father is not like the earthly father, if that's how you get round your earthly father. There is only one mediator. There's only one person who can get you through to the only God that ever existed. It's Jesus. Now I'll tell you two reasons why he can get you through why he's the only mediator and why Christianity is therefore exclusive and says you'll never get to God through Buddha, you'll never get to God through Muhammad, you'll never get to God through Mary, you'll only get to God through Jesus. No man comes to the Father but by me. Two reasons. First, he's the only person who's God and man together. It's so obvious. I need a mediator who's God and can talk to God and who's man and who understands me. I need a mediator who's both, not someone vaguely in between, but someone who's both, who's known what it is to be divine and is divine and who knows what it is to be human and who understands. That's the person I need. And if Mary understands me because she's human, she, she's not divine. She's not God. And it's because Jesus is uniquely God and man that he can bring his hands together with me in them. And there I am with God. Indeed, to talk to Jesus is to get through to God. The other reason is this. I need someone who will mediate for me with God. Someone who will be the go-between or speak to God on behalf of poor old JDP. How can I get that? What could he say about me? that would get God interested? What could he say about me that would tell God I'm a good chap? Because Jesus knows me. And here's the other reason. He gave his life a ransom for all. No other person did that for me. And when he goes to God, he pleads, not me, but himself. And the hands he lifts up to God are pierced hands for me. Now what does this word ransom mean? I'll tell you. When those children and passengers were hijacked and taken to Jordan, 
more than one member of this church was willing and made it known to go and take the place of one of those children that they might be set free. Let's come more up to date. Supposing Prime Minister Trudeau of Canada had said to the FLQ, if you'll release Monsieur Laporte, this is before they killed him, if you'll release Monsieur Laporte, you can have me. That is precisely what the word translated ransom here means. It means literally an exchange person an exchange price. And the thing that Jesus did for me that makes him unique as a mediator is he can say to God, accept me as a hostage instead of this man. Take me instead of him. And nobody else can mediate like that. Then you've got a mediator right there where he's needed, taking my place, speaking for me and setting me free. Now that's my preaching. We have a duty to pray for all men of all colors and all races. And our prayer must be as wide as that. But in our preaching, I say there's only one man can help you. The man, Christ Jesus. Don't forget that he's still a man. I have a job persuading unbelievers that he's God, but I have a job persuading believers that he's man still. Jesus has a human body still. He's still a human being. We don't have a high priest untouched with our infirmities, but he, he understands. And to have a human being in heaven who is divine and a savior is all you need. And my heart bleeds when I talk to people who are trusting another human being to get them through to God, whether a live human being or a dead one trying to get through to God through someone else. There is, and I quote here Russell Mills, who spoke last night and preached the same gospel right here in this church, there is only one God and there is only one way to that one God, Jesus. Well, that's our prayer and that's our preaching. And our preaching, if it's narrow and about one man, must be as wide as our prayer for all men. And you notice we go back to the word all. There is one God and one mediator who gave himself a ransom for all. And Paul says, and I've been appointed a preacher to the Gentiles, to anybody, the outcast, the untouchable, the people beyond the pale, the people whom you thought never would belong to God. I've been appointed to go and preach to them. He uses three words about himself, preacher, apostle, teacher. A preacher is someone who rings a bell and says, oh yes, oh yes, listen to me. I've got an announcement to make. An apostle is someone who says, I've been sent by a king to give you this announcement. And a teacher is someone who says, it is my task to instruct you in the truth. Well, now so much for our duty. I'd like to stop there, but I've got to go on. Our demeanor is important. It does matter how you dress when you go to church, though not in the way that society often thinks. It does matter how you behave in church, though again I'm glad we're getting away from some of the rather rigid formality. You can have the order of a cemetery in a church, and the order that we have must be the order of life, not the order of death. But nevertheless, there are guidance rules in scripture as to how to behave in church. First of all, the men. Funnily enough, we are told here of a posture for prayer. And it's not to kneel. It's not to stand. It's to do something with your hands. Now, I don't know where we got this from. I'm told that it's got something to do with the Gothic archway. And I'm not sure which came first, whether the arch came from the praying hands or the praying hands from the arch. But some people have said this, that you should do this with your hands. Well, that's expressive. But in the Bible, they prayed like this. Just held out their hands. How expressive. It's 
much more expressive than that. This is the natural gesture when you're asking for something. A child uses this. A child says, please, please can I have this? Lifting up hands is the most natural gesture in the world. May I suggest that you might like to try it? Even in church, just sit with your hands like that on your knees, but just sit there. It'll help you to realize you're asking for something from King and you're praying. But according to this, we are to pray with holy hands. A minister of a church came to me once and he said, David, I've given up smoking. And uh, he had been a heavy smoker and I asked him, well, what made you do that? He said, it was last Sunday morning. The people came to the rail of the church and they knelt down and I took white bread and I gave them a piece of white bread and he said I suddenly noticed how brown my fingers were as I passed the white bread out. He said I felt I just couldn't use hands like that to give the body of Christ to people so I've stopped. Now that's very practical but what Paul is meaning here is this. If you're going to lift these hands up to God they've got to be clean hands. Now, what does he mean? Now, I as a boy remember vividly mother saying, if you washed your hands, or you hold them back here, that's the line, there. And she always used to say something else. She always used to say, turn them over <laughs> and go back. <laughs> you know, have you washed your hands? If you're coming to ask for food from God, it's not so important that they should be washed with water and soap. Jesus didn't really put great store by that. He was criticized for eating meals without washing his hands first. But we're told of holy hands. That means hands that are wholly dedicated to him. Hands that are going to do things for him during the week. They may be hard and horny hands, but then Jesus' hands were. He'd made chairs and tables for a long time. But they were holy hands that wouldn't budge a job, that wouldn't make a crooked door frame or window frame. They were hands that offered their work to God. They were hands that were going to handle things that would help. And his hands were hands that would heal and touch. Have you ever studied the mention of the hands of Christ? It's a wonderful thing. Laid his hands on them. Touched them. Men lift up hands, but they must be hands that are going to do the right thing during the week. With your hands you can do wrong things. Lift up holy hands. And have hearts of harmony. One translation translates the next phrase without anger or argument. When we pray, the one thing we are to avoid is preaching in prayer. They're quite different things. We must pray, we must preach, we mustn't get them confused. It's terribly easy to have anger or argument in your heart when you're praying. Remember hearing of one prayer and a man said, Lord, heap coals of fire on my enemy's head. I'd love to see him burn, <laughs> which was a very frank and an honest prayer, but I think a misinterpretation of Scripture. When we pray, we are to lift up hands without argument, disputation. Prayer is not the place to disagree. We're not praying to people or praying against them. We're praying to God. Holy hands and hearts of harmony. That's enough for the men. Well, there's only one verse for the men and about five for the women, so I'm just following Paul. Well, now what about the women? Let the women likewise... Let me say straight away that it seems to me that in the New Testament the women took part in public worship. But there were limits to the part they took. It seems to me quite clear that they prayed and they prophesied. 1 Corinthians 11 tells us that. But as we'll see in a moment, they were not allowed to teach, which is what we call preaching today, but is in fact teaching. Now this was the line drawn and therefore when Paul says the women also or likewise it seems to me that he's thinking of them praying too. That's what the word also means. The men should pray like this and the women also but he doesn't tell them about their hands or their hearts. He tells them about certain other things. Now before we plunge into these dangerous and difficult waters let me say some general things. 
I know that many women don't like Paul. I know that because whenever I preach what he says, they don't like me either. And Paul's views on women in the church have been criticized and dismissed on three grounds. First of all, there are some who say his attitude was purely psychological. He was a bachelor and he was a woman-hating bachelor and he didn't like women and you can see his psychology coming out. I think that's a libel for there is not a shred of evidence in the gospel about this. He had some wonderful women colleagues. You oh dear. Syntyche, Lois, Eunice, Priscilla. And it's very interesting to notice that Peter, who was married, says exactly the same things in his letter as Paul says here. So you're not going to get away with it that Paul was psychologically unbalanced. Secondly, there are those who say, well, Paul was simply a child of his day. They kept women down in those days and he was just simply reflecting the views of the people around him and we've grown out of this. At the very highest, he was still terribly Jewish in outlook. I don't believe that either. If that's true, then we can throw most of what Paul said out as simply a child of his day. Thirdly, there are those who say he said what he did about women because of the sociological conditions then that he was simply saying something that applied then in the conditions of society then, but don't apply today. I don't see all that much difference between society today and society then, if you read Romans 1. It's really a test to me of your belief in the inspiration of Scripture. Is this the word of the Lord or is it not? Is Paul giving his own idea or is the Lord speaking through him? Let me say this. First, in Christ, Paul said there is no difference of status. Neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, bond nor free. No difference in status. Secondly, he employed women in gospel service. Thirdly, he commends many women for their qualities. Fourth, he recommends marriage and he praises wives and mothers. Fifthly, he has the highest view of women. And I could give you many quotes. 1 Corinthians 7, 1 Corinthians 11, Ephesians 5, a very high view of women. Do you tell me that a man is a woman hater who says there is no difference in status, who employs women in gospel service, who commends them, who recommends marriage, who upholds womanhood in every possible way, you telling me he's a woman hater? No. But I'm going to tell you this. In the modern world, the roles have been reversed. And if we're not careful, what we are doing is reflecting our society instead of reflecting God's word. And it's a question of which is going to govern us, the world in which we live or the word which we read. Now let's see what Paul actually does say. Two things about women in church. First of all, seemly adornment. A man bolder than me said uh, a woman's dress is a mirror of her mind. And he singles out hairstyle, jewelry and clothes and two things he condemns in connection with these three. One, expense. Two, exhibitionism. That's all. Exhibitionism the brazen flaunting of self and expense, the spending of far too much money in these three realms. Do you know that Pliny, a Roman historian, tells of a wedding he attended where the dress cost 432,000 pounds in our money. But I don't think there were many of that sort of wealthy woman in the early church. And Paul is against these two things. Can I pass on to you a little poem of two lines which I think is a marvelous summary of biblical teaching on fashion. Be not the first by whom the new is tried, nor yet the last to lay the old aside. Now, isn't that lovely? I think that's about as sensible as I have ever come across. In other words, there are two extremes to avoid, ostentatious extravagance and careless dowdiness. 
and old-fashionedness, or whatever the noun is. Be not the first by whom the new is tried, nor yet the last to lay the old aside. I think I'll leave it there. Except that Paul says, listen, real beauty is not what you put on, but what you give out. It's not what you do to yourself, it's what you do to others. And let your beauty be that of good works as befits those who profess godliness. And I know that's the secret of real beauty. I was telling some ladies in the city temple a week ago about this, about a beauty queen competition which Dr. Sangster held in his church, which may shock you, but there was one qualification. Every entrant had to be over 60 years of age. And he did it to prove that real beauty is not skin deep, it's something much, much deeper. It comes out, and if it is true that every one of us over 40 is responsible for our face, what a frightening thought. Well, now, let your beauty, he says, not be put on. Let it come out. Let it not be in what you do for yourself, but in what you do for other people. And then strike the happy medium. Now, the other thing, which is even more unpopular, a submissive attitude. Their part in public assembly is to learn rather than to teach. To be humble and deferent. Now, this sounds pretty rough to some. In fact, brides today often refuse to say the words to obey when they get married, to love, honor, and full stop. Paul gives two reasons, and I simply pass them on to you because he finds them not in society, but in the very word of God in the beginning. Here are the two reasons. Woman was created second and sinned first. And for those two reasons, it becomes her nature to let the men have the authority in the assembly. Now, why should this be? Take the first, created second. God did not create woman to be man's competitor, but man's companion. And what lovely companions they make, but what poor competitors. I mean by that, that God, when he created us male and female, had a reason for doing so. It wasn't to create two kind of teams to see which team could get on top. It was to create partners. And there are things that my wife can do that I can't do. And things that I can do that she can't. And God made us to be partners. I'm reminded of the famous punster who was approached by a woman who thought herself in every way able to cope with what a man does and said, can you think of any essential difference between you and me? And he said, Madam, I cannot conceive, which is a very clever answer. <laughs> and woman was made to bring up children, to create a home and family, and to glorify God. Not exclusively. There are other ministries of women who don't get married that are lovely ministries to people. Intuition, sensing a need where a man like me just couldn't. I remember visiting a dear old soul and I was talking to her, and, as ministers do. And one of the church members came into the bedroom, a lady also visiting. And she went straight to the bed, lifted up the patient, puffed the pillow up and just put it down a few inches. I would never have done that. I'd never have noticed it. A man wouldn't. A man would just have sat and talked. But a woman came in and she saw a ministry and she did it. Let's recognize the function. Equal status, but different functions. We're partners. And this is our calling. Not that women haven't a ministry of speaking to people about the Lord, of praying, of so much. But let's remember that God created us for particular functions. Woman was created second, but she did sin first. She was deceived. And it is devilish to deceive a woman. And it's easier to do so than to deceive a man. Which is why it's criminal for high-pressure salesmen to wait till the man has left the house and then go and try and get the woman to sign a contract for some higher purchase. And so for these two reasons... Because woman was created to partner and be a companion, not a competitor. 
And because, because of her loving personal nature, it is more possible to be deceived. It is wise in the assembly for men to teach and have the authority. But, here I come to the last verse, yet woman will be saved through bearing children if she continues in faith and love and holiness with modesty. Do you know, I've come across five different interpretations of this verse. I haven't time to give them all to you. The childbirth atones for her sins. Well, that's a contradiction of the gospel. That she will be kept safe through childbearing. Well, that doesn't always happen. That she will be saved even though she must bear children. Well, I think that doesn't really fit into scripture either. Some even say that this means she will be saved through the birth of the child, Christ Jesus. But it took a midwife to tell me what this verse meant. I was talking it over with a midwife one day and she said, you know, I understand that verse. And having read all the books of scholars who disagreed about it, I thought, now I'm on to it. What do you mean? And she said this, you know, when a woman is bearing a child and I'm by the bed, she's going through the pain and yet the hope and expectancy, all the fears of things going wrong and yet all the hopes of things going right. When she's going through that and is creating life, she gets very near to God. And very often people, women whom I've visited who've never mentioned religion, they call on God sincerely at that time. They're near to reality, near to life, near to death, and they're so near, they call on God. And she said, I have known women who because of that experience sought God later and went on to know the Lord. But she said, I've also known a lot who didn't continue. When the crisis was over, they got so wrapped up in their family again that they didn't go on. Does that not fit? Women will be saved through childbearing if she continues in faith and love and holiness with modesty. In other words, there is an experience which is a unique reminder of reality, of life, of creation, of God and of death. An experience which could bring a woman to put her trust in God and go on and continue in that. Well, that's enough for today. We'll go on next week to look at elders and deacons in chapter 3.